Hi everyone, welcome to today's Peanut Labs webinar. My name is Annie Pettit and I am the Chief Research Officer at Peanut Labs, a company that specializes in self-serve sampling. Uh, thank you for taking the time to join me today. Uh, this webinar will be about 30 to 45 minutes long and it will be recorded. So don't worry if you have to step out for a few minutes. We'll put the recording on the Peanut Labs resources page with all of our other webinar recordings. Uh, please do remember to put your phone or computer on mute just in case there is a sound problem. And if you would like to chat with other audience members on Twitter, you can use the hashtag Peanut Labs Media. Now, today we are going to talk about using margin of error uh, to generalize from the population um, from non-probability samples. I'm sure most people here know that margin of error is a statistic designed to be used with probability samples. But since most online research panels are convenient samples, albeit extremely well-managed convenient samples of pre-screened volunteers, um, some statistical purists say it's not appropriate to use margin of error. And in fact, most industry standards and guidelines say that research using non-probability samples cannot show margin of error when generalizing to the wider population. So you are in for a treat today. I have with me four experts on statistics and market research, and they are going to share their personal opinions in a debate on this topic. So let me take just a few minutes to introduce everyone we have here today. So first, there's me. <laughs> and as much as I love statistics, I cannot hold a candle to today's panelists who know far more than I do. So I will just be moderating. Our five panelists include John Bremer, who is the Global Chief Research and Strategy Officer at Toluna. His background is in statistics and he specializes in non-probability sampling and online survey research. Nancy Brigham is the Senior Vice President and Global Head of Research on Research at Ipsos Interactive Services. And she also has many years of practical experience with statistics. Our next panelist is Steve Mossop, who is the president at Insights West. And Steve's claim to fame today is that he has published more than 125 press releases that include margin of error with non-probability samples, and he's proud of it. And we also have Trent Buskirk, who is the vice president of statistics and methodology at Marketing Systems Group. So Trent co-authored the APOR statement on the use of credibility intervals for surveys with Rob Santos and Andrew Gelman. So as we go through the, uh, I have a few questions to start off, so I'm going to go through those. But in the meantime, absolutely do feel free to type your own questions into the question box at the side of your screen. And I will ask as many of those questions as I can. So first, let me start by welcoming our panelists. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hi. Hello. <laughs> All right, so um, a very basic question to start with. Do you think that most researchers know about this issue of using margin of error in terms of probability and non-probability samples? So um, this is John. Um, just. Just for the audience out there, we uh, three of the four of us have um, previously had a conversation, particularly on this question. So, uh, if, if uh, uh, you know, I think th there's some debate. Uh, I would say probably not. Um, I, I think that uh, most researchers, particularly market researchers, um, and those who use the data, uh, unless they're in a certain arena. Uh, take margin of error or variance estimates that are put out either in a methodology statement or another statement, uh, sort of as given. Uh, I think they don't think too much about it. Certainly when it comes around to election times, margin of error gets 
a little bit of a discussion really in terms of the horse race that uh, we're seeing uh, between candidates. But again, there it's not always used correctly. It's, you know, it, it's used as sort of a comfort uh, mechanism. And so um, I, I think people have heard it. People have seen it. They don't really understand uh, the intricacies of margin of error, when it should be used, when it shouldn't be. Um, uh, and I think, you know, that's just how it is. John, I, I would agree. I mean, I think we all, we understand the term margin of error. We throw around a bit loosely, but the intricacies and, and the where we can apply it and where we can't apply it is a bit of a mystery, even to researchers. And we're left scratching our heads wondering why are we having this debate when uh, it's really used more often than not as stamp of quality on our results. And so if somebody posts a margin of error, we can put our geek hats on and say, we're statistically valid in our opinions that we collected and to make us look smart. But uh, for the most part, uh, I'd say researchers aren't aware of the debate that goes on. I think another aspect, um, and I wasn't privy to the earlier conversation of the three, so I'm, I may be saying what you all have already said, but something, this is Trent, one of the things to think about is, you know, when you're in a basic stat class and you're learning about confidence intervals and margins of error and so on, you're often learning this from a perspective of sort of an infinite population. You don't have a finite population framework, you don't have a sampling framework, you don't even have a sampling design in that discussion. And so I think part of the issue here is really trying to understand when you apply margin of error, it's a statistic that can be applied in many different venues. But the way the statistic is to be interpreted is really uh, <clears throat> refers to the framework that the statistic was derived under. So I think it's a really important issue, and I think that's why it's really complicated, I think, for some folks, because you learn margin of error in a stat class based on normal distribution and IID variables and data and this sort of bigger model population framework, and then we switch it over to a design that says, well, we don't have a simple random sample. I've got a stratified sample or a cluster sample. Now what do I do, and, and how do I revise what I knew from my basic stat class? So I think a lot of the ways we talk about this, I think, forget about the context in which that statistic is derived, which I think is more important than the actual value of the statistic. Yeah, absolutely. That's a, oh, sorry. I think this is no, a very good point, um, especially, I just want to say, especially as we um, in market research move away, so put us, putting aside polling, but um, just general market research, as we move away from more, some gym pop samples, more into targeted sampling and smaller, smaller uh, populations to start with, we, we haven't um, changed the way we think about margin of error in any way. We still apply that broader way of thinking about it. I just yeah. want to add one thing, because I think the history, the historical way in which we have applied and used margin of error is important here. And I started research back in the day when they were just finishing door-to-door -door interviewing and starting on the telephone. So it's been around a while, but uh, I think the margin of error was often stated as a, as a measure of quality in the results because there was issues with small sample sizes, because telephone surveying or door-to-door -door interviewing was expensive. So you'd have polling companies publish results. and. If they had small sample sizes, you could always point to margin of error, well, how good is your research? And now in this era of panels and social media, it's really a non-issue. There's thousands of people that answer surveys. And, and so the whole debate over margin of error is kind of transitioned into something quite different than what it was originally intended for. Well, I, I think that there, there are two parts of that debate, one of which is <clears throat> the appropriateness of margin of error, you know, sort of as a uh, an indicator of variance, you know, uh, projecting the population. Um, and whether the conditions are, are appropriate for the way that we classically calculate it. And I would actually say for almost any survey, and this doesn't matter whether it's online or telephone or even most face-to-face, -face, uh, I don't think the conditions with regard to which uh, margin of error is to be calculated actually apply. Um, the um, just as one example, um, you know, even though <laughs> Annie nicely put it out there that I'm an expert in online survey research, in, in my work at Harris, now uh, part of it is part of Toluna, part of it is part of Nielsen, uh, we started actually um, putting a statement on our telephone surveys that uh, basically said because of uh, non-response, 
because of uh, other things, the theoretical margin of error couldn't be calculated. Now, uh, if it was for PR purposes, nobody's going to publish a telephone survey that says that. We sort of put the number up top and then kept the, kept the statement. But I think that applies even these days for telephone surveys. So are you saying you, you, you display a margin of error and then say, but it's not appropriate to use the margin of error? So that was at Harris. The, uh, and so uh, the quick answer is yes. Uh, but the, more, the longer answer is uh, at Harris um, for telephone studies, we displayed a margin of error and then said, but this is a theoretical number. Uh, we don't believe that this actually matches. So why would, now, why would you say it then? Uh, because people want the number. It's purely a client requirement. And we're not going to just put it out there pretending like it actually applies. So uh, in those cases where they absolutely had to have it, uh, and this actually does apply in some cases at Toluna now for online, they absolutely have to have it. We say, in theory, this would be the number, but this is not a probability sample, uh, and so that can't be calculated. Um, for most surveys we put out, we, don't, we, we actually say it can't be calculated, but if you need a number, uh, we, we put it out there. <laughs> so why not just throw out any random number? If margin of error isn't applicable, you know, throw out pi, 3.1415. That's too large, Annie. Yeah, we're, we're, um, I, I actually think um, in terms of, sorry, sorry, um, in terms of uh, throwing out a number, the theoretical number I think is appropriate. And again, apology to the folks who weren't around, but uh, Andrew Gilman said something the last time we talked about this, which is appropriate, which is that's the least bound, and that's the least bound for any sort of survey you do. So. Um, you know, you have at least that much variance. And, uh, you know, again, in those cases where we have to have one or have to have something, we're not going to pretend that it, it actually applies, but we'll say the theoretical case would be this. Isn't that kind of sitting on most sides of the fence? Sorry, Sorry I think Andy? maybe trying to say something. Isn't that <laughs> yeah. sitting on both sides of the fence, like take a stand and, and – um, give data that you believe in that is true? Uh, just in terms of business, we're not going to throw away business just because we're going to take a stand on something that everybody, you know, all the telephone folks are, are putting out there anyways. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure that we can look at it as taking this, being on the fence. I think that um, some of the, the things, uh, I will, I'll say something that some of you guys have heard before, for um, we a lot of our or all of our classical statistics were based in a different really a different era era <laughs> sorry they um, you know where where research was quite different where we are today the world we live in today research is very very different it is evolving very quickly it, and we have to adapt to it so I, I often wonder do we take these old paradigms and try to put them into our new world or do we just create new paradigms to start with. So what we've done in the market research industry is we've tried to bridge those paradigms. We've tried to say, I'm going to take the old ways of looking at things and I'm going to see if there's a bridge and I can bring it into the new world. So for example, at Ipsos, we use credibility intervals, Bayesian credibility intervals. So it's a proxy for margin of error for polling. Um, I know that Trent could probably talk to that way more than I can because he's written a very good paper on it. Um, but that is a way that we try to proxy it um, so that people feel comfortable. As John said, clients demand it. People want to feel comfortable, and some of those old paradigms still make them comfortable, even if they might not be totally appropriate. Uh, and, and from Fred, our, our we've, we've and issued a... Gentlemen, could you just say your name when, you're, when you start to speak so the audience knows who's chatting? Sure. It's Steve here. And I just wanted to comment on what we say. And we've done 125 press releases of our company and we've honestly we've wobbled back and forth between the uh, different versions of what we talked about currently in our, our last release we talked about we say quick sentence all statistical margins of error arguably not applicable to online panels we have assumed that the same margins of error applies if it were a true unweighted random probability sample so we give the margin of error and that appears in probably a third of our releases and other times we just skip that and go right to margin of error 
But I'll, I'll, I'll lay out an interesting uh, point with that. Out of the, you know, we, we field, on any particular release, we may field up to 10 different media calls and talk to the media. And I would say that out of the 125 releases, that there, there's been maybe one or two or three reporters who have asked about margin of error. And all their questions re, uh, relating to the credibility of our work does not center around margin of error. So maybe we're debating something that's irrelevant, just to be uh, blunt. You know, uh, this is Trent. Um, one of Nancy's earlier points, and uh, I'll, I'll mention something about that, and then I'll come back to another point I wanted to make. And that is, um, you know, in the era of, of working at, say, targeted samples, right? So let's say, for example, that you have a very specific <clears throat> sample that you want to sort of um, answer questions about. And this sample happens to be very, very small, and you sample everyone from this population then theoretically, there is no margin of error, right? From, from the design-based perspective, purely design-based perspective, the margin of error would be zero because there's no replicative variance from that der derivative. So, I mean, um, you know, but from the sort of superpopulation framework or from what we learned in our stats class about, you know, IID samples and so on and so forth, you could theoretically calculate a margin of error that would be different than zero. And so you really have to think about sort of what paradigm you're in here when you apply the margin of error and interpretation beyond that number is so important and context for the interpretation is so important. And so now I'm sort of speaking to the, the sort of questions about moving into the new paradigm and I think that's a it's certainly important to think about how things are evolving and moving into the old paradigm. But I think the fundamental principles of quality and how we measure that quality um, in some ways can be certainly informed by our past. And things that we don't see reported, we see an over-reporting or an over-emphasis on margin of error, but we don't see an emphasis on what's the interclass correlation coefficient? How, how similar are your panelists when they respond to a particular question? What's the variability in the response distribution that you're talking about? Because margin of error would be derived from that response distribution, but I don't really care about the sample size. I want to know the effective sample size. I want to know what your non-response follow-up was, because that, as John mentioned, can certainly alter probability and non-probability estimates. There are lots of other things that sort of go into the ability to understand quality, and margin of error, I think, is gets lost in the context. And I think that's really, really important. I'm not, I'm not sort of knocking the number or not, but I think context is certainly important for inference. Okay, let me, yeah, Steve. Oh, go ahead. Steve here, I couldn't agree more with that. I mean, there are so many other factors and, and in, in the day and age that we're talking about online panels, there's so many things like the proportion of females versus males on a particular panel, the underrepresentation of the 18 to 34 year olds, uh, the variance in opinion or even the motivators for why people join a panel, all those things factor into the quality of a panel, but we don't talk about them. And there's no, there's no industry standard of, of a measurement that we can apply to those to say, is this a good sample or is this a bad sample? We, we solely rely on margin of error and give it way too much of an uh, overemphasis. So as, as a panel, do you think that just generally only talking about margin of error is, uh, is grossly insufficient? I would suggest that it is, uh, but we don't have, we, we're now having a, a debate in this call, and we have a debate in the industry, but we have made no progress in our industry, I think, is, is the associations that represent us to, to say what are those metrics and what should we be stating in publicly released polls especially, because those are the ones that typically get the most attention. Yeah, the other part of this is Trent. I think the other part of this is um, you know, when I read about sort of um, how these press releases come out or how people actually, you know, speak about margin of error and so on, what often trails in that conversation or at least in the, in the reporting is what kind of uh, survey or sample was actually used in that process, right? So in order, in order to properly interpret the statistic itself, I would need to know a little bit more than just the number. And so if I see a small number and I see two small numbers compared to one another, I might think, oh, the smaller one is the better survey. But in fact, it may not be. And so I, I think there are additional pieces of information that we at least have to convey if we're going to report a margin of error or if we're going to report that a margin of error can't be calculated. There are other things I would want to know, like how, what's the variance in your, in, in the, you, you reported the mean, but what's the variance? I can take that and really use that as information to at least understand how if people were more similar or less similar. Sample size is great, but it's not the only, it's, it's not completely telling. 
And I think that this is John. This gets back to Nancy's sort of new versus old paradigm uh, discussion, which is uh, what do we report? You know, we've been so used to margin of error. We've been so used to, you know, how it's been. Uh, I think Trent makes a good point, which is uh, if we're trying to assess the quality, assess uh, some other factors, we can potentially report different things uh, that actually go into it. Um, but uh, for, and this is another discussion we've been having, uh, particularly within the online uh, industry, we have a lot of industry-wide discussions about things. Uh, we have standard. We have groups that develop standards. Now, sometimes I would I would suggest they're conflicting, et cetera, et cetera. But um, you know, we haven't actually developed the standard for what to report in these situations. And I think you know, people some may not agree with it, but at least if we came up with a standard, um, you know, you could debate it from that standpoint. The fact that we don't have one right now, um, I think, allows this debate to continue sort of in an open, swirling way. And Steve, I would add a comment here. I, I think we, we're, we're embarrassing ourselves. We've had 10 years to think about this. Our first online surveys were done in around 93, 94. So we've had a long time to think about this and react to it, but we haven't made any progress as an industry to address it, at least publicly. If I think, if I think back to um, the media's use of polls, they want to, or some of them, want to report a single number that shows you know they've done their due diligence so if margin of error is not the right thing or is not sufficient um, what are they supposed to do are they supposed to incorporate an entire paragraph that shows a variety of different quality measures I would suggest yes that there, mm. there could be some measure we used to have a thing called record of call back in the day when telephone was the primary mechanism to collect data. And that was the industry standard that was published. There was about 15 different variables in the record of call that would say whether it was a good sample or not. Yeah. You know, this is Trent. Um, one of the things that sort of strikes me is even if you use credible interval as the way around this problem, um, you know, there are several parts uh, to be able to interpret a credible interval correctly. I mean. Um, the way you specify the prior distribution, the type of credible interval that you've specified, you can choose things like the narrowest interval or the highest posterior density interval and all those other technical words that we can just keep going on about. But the point is, I can't properly interpret even a credible interval unless I know something more about how you actually did it or what choice you made. So even if the industry or the media is pressing for a single number, I'm not sure that we can take this multidimensional problem and push it down into a univariate solution for them. It's more complicated than that because we've chosen multiple ways to collect data now in the new paradigm, as Nancy mentioned. But yeah, so I, John, I'm, I'm going to agree with you on that, but then also say there's a way around that. Um, so um, as you, uh, you know, uh, Ipsos has done a good job. I, I do think they've done, they've done a real service with the, the, with the credible interval. Um, I know that Doug Rivers uh, at one point came up with his pseudo margin of error. I did as well. But the secret is, um, you know, even now uh, with margin of error, when somebody reports one, I would suggest they still need context and, and other uh, issues around that. I would suggest that we get around that through um, uh, the methodology statement. And so uh, by that I mean no matter what happens, uh, and I don't want to split media PR types things from other types of research, but honestly we control other types of research better where if we're not reporting it uh, in a public uh, framework, I would suggest we do it. We actually already do it pretty well. We don't necessarily do a margin of error. We, we put a lot of things into the methodology statement. Um, it, I would suggest we come up with some standards, you know, perhaps a credible interval, perhaps something else, where they could perhaps say one thing, because that's not going to change uh, in the media. But then the methodology statements, those who are actually looking for the information, we have a second standard for information that goes in there. I, I don't think we're going to change the media. Uh, you know, when it comes to election polling, they're going to 
want to re report sort of the uh, the number and uh, any confidence around it uh, and whatever we choose that to be. Um, but then those who are actually interested, and I think we started off with saying most people don't know and probably aren't searching for that information, but we should provide that information for people to be able to then go out and say, but you shouldn't believe this because, you know, their sample is crap based on X, Y, and Z. Uh, so that information should be provided. I think the methodology statements can provide the way that we actually get to that. Yeah, I, I think agree. that that's the only way we're going to get get there because uh, things are just changing so quickly. Like I'm thinking we're talking panels, but most of us um, who are doing an online panel or a lot of us are, are also starting to incorporate um, non-panel sample into our into our sample frame. So uh, we've, we've actually found that that gives us even better estimates with more precision um, to open it up outside panels. But again, then you have to think differently because how do you then think about that population? It's a different way of thinking about the population than it is for panels. I have a comment yeah, from, from someone writing in. They're saying, um, it seems the talk of the new world or different era or we publish with a note saying it isn't accurate are just lame justifications. Um, uh, why are we, these aren't justifications for why we do it even though we know it's bad. So there, it seems a bit of an argument to um, let's not worry about doing our research uh, poorly. <laughs> You know, let's just keep going on and uh, and not strive to do the best methodologies we can do. It, it does become a bit of a crux or, or an excuse, doesn't it? The margin of error is, is a quality stamp that we all depend upon, and there is so much more to that debate. I think the other part of this is going to be this trend again, um, sort of if if this is really where things go, there's a lot of education that has to happen between now and sort of when we, I guess we're already hit the ground running, but I mean the main part of it is, you know, um, if you're going to compare two polls, one of them posts a margin of error from, say, a sampling design, one of them posts a margin of error from a non-probability design, and then a third one posts a credible interval um, error um, interval. And so, you know, in order to compare the quality across those three, there has to be some understanding of the differences in how that information is being presented, even beyond the numbers that are given. Um, the sheer interpretations alone of these things are really different across the paradigms. And so now we're talking not only about um, you know, a difference in probability versus non-probability samples, but we're also talking about two views of probability sampling, one from the Bayesian world, which is the supporting credible intervals, and one of them from the frequentist approach, which is more traditionally supported um, sampling approaches that we've, you know, n we've been using for a long time. So I think that shifts in the advances of statistics are sort of swirling in here, and things get a bit confusing when you try to compare these two numbers across things with different interpretations. So I think we owe it to our, you know, respective constituents to educate them as well and to give a little bit of pushback when, when one number is requested. We say, sure, we can give you that number, but let me give you the interpretation of this number because no two polls are the same and no two methodologies are exactly the same, but let me give you, point out some differences that are key to understanding the methodology and the inferences that are derived from that methodology. And, and what's happening then is that uh, we're getting a segmentation of explanations coming from different companies. And mm -hmm. if, unless we're yeah. all together on the same page on yeah. this, we're going to yeah, have right. the Ipsos mm -hmm. of the world, the Inveronics, the Angus Reeves right. of the world coming out with their own statements and confusing the industry even further, saying, well, how do I, it doesn't even say the same thing. There's not even a common language anymore. So right. we have to get together on this. Otherwise, we're going to create mass confusion. And I'll give one, one small example. The question that comes out most commonly from reporters, the releases that we do, is the, the understanding from reporters of what a panel is and how it works is so off the map. Most, most reporters think it's an online voting site where you go and you express your vote just like you would in a, a newspaper or a blog. And that's their understanding of, of polling and how it works is click to vote, yes, no. Uh, and it's just so far off the reality of how we actually recruit and maintain panels. Right. Yeah. What do you think we ought to do? What, what should be our next step as an industry? Industry standards. Yeah, I agree. So, I think, I, and again, we're, we're going to continue to have this discussion. We're going to have sort of the swirling around, do we report, do we not report? 
you know, and um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, if we don't have some standards that have some good thought of behind them, uh, you know, different people are going to do different things, and it's going to lead to different interpretations. Some people's going to, some folks are going to have certain amount of information that they put out. Others going to have different information. Um, you know, again, it. If we set industry standards, it's not going to, we're not all going to hold hands and sing kumbaya. Oh, come we're on. We're going to debate them. Annie, I would with you. Don't worry about that. Excellent. <laughs> but, um, but you can have the debate from those standards. And, um, you know, everyone, you know, folks are, are applying. And, uh, again, I still, uh, sorry, Trent, I still think that uh, more traditional ways I, I, I would actually argue you can't be called probability samples anymore. I know that's controversial, but the standards do need to address how you actually would compare across what people would call probability samples and, um, and uh, non-probability samples. Is that easy? I don't think so, but we have to work towards that. And another yeah, suggestion. I, I agree. I don't think there are any probability sampling anymore. Um, and I mean, if even with phone, and I said that in a, a, at a client event recently, and the client was like, well, why are we still doing phone sampling, and it's so expensive, and, you know. Because it's I, more probabilistic I, probability sampling than. than uh, oh, sorry, John? I was just saying, because it, it still has elements of probability sampling. I wouldn't call the effect uh, it's a probability well, and, and that's what we said. I mean, there's always you're always you're, we still use mall intercepts when the occasion calls for it, right? Like, there, it, it's really about the business decision you're trying to make and the risk you're willing to assume in that decision. And so, so that's you know, but you, you we do have to be careful in how we talk about all of these. And I think John is right. I think that um, standards are really the way to go. Industry standards. And, and standards without enforcement uh, are a little bit lame, too. I think we need better and more bold representation from our industry associations to call out bad polling. Uh, and we're not doing that. I think there's a bit of fear and a little bit of, uh, it's not my role to do that, but I think we need to do it. And we've had several examples in election polling, especially so that's the most uh, at the forefront of, of the public limelight. Uh, we've had instances of terrible polls being done and, and results being way off. And the industry is just very reluctant to call those out and chastise people who step out of line. This, this is Trent. Um, you know, one of the things that APOR is trying to do, uh, I think, I think nationally, is this sort of transparency initiative. And I think in the in the article on credible intervals, we we mention a little bit about this. And basically, it's trying to get a sort of core set of standards around what do you report in terms of making available um, processes that you used. And one thing I was just going to mention about um, probability samples being archaic or whatever, I, I do think the probability samples exist. Um, the problem is that respondents get in the way. And um, so, so, I mean, you know, I think from a theoretical perspective, I'm controlling the selection mechanisms and I'm, in, I'm sort of imposing a design-based structure on that. Now, what happens after I leave that, take that sample to the field is completely different. And there's a lot of adjustments that have to be made. I totally grant you that, and I make those adjustments on a regular basis. Um, and, and so you're right that in some ways you sort of get into that. But there have been several papers that have shown that even with just you know, the differences between did you, con did you select the respondent or did the respondent select you result in very different outcomes on the back end that we can quantify. And so that, to me, sort of still shows that there's promise in sort of using the old with the new. I'm certainly not, not sort of jettisoning the new, because I think it's, we're, we're certainly in a, in a new era. But there are things like effective sample size. How similar are the respondents that you get in the mall intercept? If they're all very similar, the yeah. statistics that you will project will, will seem far more precise than maybe they really are in general. And so it's those kinds of things that I just have to be aware of and, and sort of inf and informed by my past as a sort of strict probability sample person, and that sort of still invoke um, measures or indications of quality to me, not necessarily about the, re the, the probability mechanism, but just in terms of what actually am I getting in my sample and what inferences can I draw? Does this really seem that precise or not? I, I think those are issues that are still germane today. So Trent, I think you brought up a really great point and I love your use of 
effective sample size. So for those who don't know, most of market research, particularly with the tables that are produced, uh, produce an effective sample size as part of that, um, uh, you know, the pantheon of, of paper. Um, we don't tend to actually, and so in client presentations and things of that nature, uh, statistical testing is typically based on uh, effective sample size, but we don't bring that out in what we actually say. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I know, again, um, I think we're, we can continue to have debates, but this gets back to standardization. It's, you know, uh, something as simple as that is something that most folks already calculate, already use, they just don't report. Right. And so if we, if we do, do industry standards, that could be one of the first things. And it, it wouldn't cause a hardship for anybody. They already have that number. They already know right. what that is. And it's quite informative for those people who really understand that in terms of the variability and the outcome that you're looking at apart from the statistic that you're using. So I, I actually think it's a, certainly a way to get us on the same page. Is let me, um, fin we're kind of getting close to the end. Let me finish off with one question for each of you to, to answer. So we've got all these uh, frameworks around what, is, what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, plenty of what we're doing wrong, um, and what we ought to do in the future. What should we be doing tomorrow? Is it this, if we had done a probability, is it a credibility interval, is it MOE? What should we do tomorrow? We have a poll to give out tomorrow. Well, I'll start, Steve Moffat here. I would uh, immediately change and come up with, I guess, my own industry standard for the lack of the wider industry standard to, to how we address this. I've, I've looked now at the several polls in the last even three or four weeks that we've put forth, and, and we do vary in terms of how we talk about it. So we're going to, tomorrow, we're going to come up with a standard wording that we're comfortable with, and hopefully the industry can lead us, rather than us lead them, uh, to come up with an industry-wide one that's accessible to everybody. But I think we're a long way away from that. Uh, Nan? I think, go ahead. Oh, sorry, from an IPSA standpoint, I think um, what we'll do is encourage our folks, our, sorry, especially our public affairs folks, to more detail into the statement around um, credibility intervals. So typically our statement is that I've seen is, is uh, fairly vague about some of the other things that you would need to, to report to understand more about the Bayesian credibility interval. So um, I want to take a look at that and say, you know, what are, what are we doing? What do we need to report um, more so that people can make, have a better understanding of what we're reporting? Yeah. Um, without a true industry standard, um, we would potentially use a slight augmentation of what we do. And so, um, Annie, you asked about our, uh, you know, one of our statements. That is not our typical statement. That is, our first statement is no margin of error. You continue with that. If pushed and uh, the client is going to walk the door, we would do the theoretical margin of error uh, with a statement that says it doesn't apply to non-probability sampling. This is a non-probability sample. Um, we would then probably add in some additional information that we've, we've discussed here. I think that's, that's fine without an industry standard. Um, until we really have an industry standard that folks agree upon, though, um, you know, you, you really, uh, you, you have to be, to understand, uh, you know, what you can do in different situations. Um, we are going to primarily, and for 95% of our jobs, say you can't calculate a margin of error and leave it at that. Hmm. This, this is Trent. Um, the first thing I would do is maybe call back my non-respondents. Um, and the second thing I might do is uh, I might look at the, and there's a theoretical justification for this if we really go into our textbooks and look at the central limit there one more time. But um, one thing I might sort of think about is if the sample size and the effective sample size are not the same, then one might that might suggest that the variance that I would use as the basis of margin of error might be too small. In other words, I'm over projecting confidence where I probably should be more conservative. So if that were the case, I might go take a step back and say, 
can I or should I adjust this variance estimate that I have from the sample that I've got to make it a little larger, to make my confidence intervals a little bit more conservative so that I can be more confident in the statement I'm making about the data that I have. So that's sort of what I would be looking into and also thinking about resampling frameworks, and that's a whole other discussion, but um, as another sort of possible solution for getting us all on the same page. That's really great. Um, uh, I think we have reached the end of our time. I would like to say a huge thank you to Trent, John, Nancy, and Steve for taking the time to share their opinions with us. I would also like to thank everyone who made the time to listen in today and possibly even a week ago. <laughs> I hope that everyone leaves with some insight into this problem, perhaps a few things to think about for tomorrow, for next year. Um, we will make this recording available as soon as we possibly can. We will send you the link in an email, so watch out for that. Uh, may all your samples be as representative as possible. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Take care.